40 rules of love chapter 1 ella northampton may 17 2008 boats were sinking outside her kitchen window on the balmy day in the spring afterward ella replayed the scene in her mind so many times that rather than a fragment from the past it felt like an ongoing moment still happening somewhere out there in the universe there they are, sitting around the table, having a late family lunch on a Saturday afternoon. Her husband was filling his plate with fried chicken legs, his favorite food. Evie was playing his knife and fork like drumsticks, while his twin, Orly, was trying to calculate how many bites of which food she could eat so as not to ruin her diet of 650 calories a day. Janet, who was a freshman at Mount Holyoke College nearby, seemed lost in her thoughts as she spread cream cheese on another slice of bread. Also at the table sat Aunt Esther, who had stopped to drop off one of her famous marble cakes and then stayed on for lunch. Ella had a lot of work to do afterward but she was not ready to leave the table just yet. Lately, they didn't have too many shared family meals and she saw this as a golden chance for everyone to reconnect. Esther, did Ella give you the good news? David suddenly asked. She found a great job. Though Della had graduated with a degree in English literature and loved fiction, she hadn't much in the field after college, other than editing small pieces for women's magazine, attending a few book clubs and occasionally writing book reviews for some local papers. That was all. There was a time when she had aspired to become a prominent book critique, but then she simply accepted the fact that life had carried her elsewhere, turning her into an industrious housewife with three kids and endless domestic responsibilities. Not that she complained, being the mother, the wife, the dog walker and the housekeeper kept her busy enough. She didn't have to be a breadwinner on the top of all these. Though none of her feminist friends from Smith College approved of her choice, she was satisfied to be a stay-at-home mom and grateful that she and her husband could afford it. Besides, she had never abandoned her passion for books and still considered herself a voracious reader. After a few years ago, things had begun to change. The children were growing up and they made it clear that they didn't need her as much as they had once. Realizing that she had too much time to spare and no one to spend it with, Ella had considered how it might be to find a job. David had encouraged her, but though they kept talking and talking about it, she really pursued the opportunities that came her way. And when she did, potential employers were always looking for someone younger or more experienced. Afraid of being rejected over and over, she simply let the subject drop. Nevertheless, in May 2008, whatever obstacle has impeded her from finding a job all these years unexpectedly vanished. Two weeks shy of her 40th birthday, she found herself working for a literary agency based in Boston. It was her husband who found her the job through one of his clients, or perhaps through one of his mistress. Oh, it's not a big deal, and I rushed to explain now. I'm only a part-time reader for a literary agent. But David seemed determined not to let her think too little of her new job.
come on, tell them it's a well-known agency, he urged, nudging her, and when she refused to comply, he heartily agreed with himself. It's a prestigious place, Esther. You should see the other assistants, girls and boys fresh out of the best colleges. Ella is the only one going back to work after being a housewife for years. Now don't be modest. Ella wondered if deep inside her husband felt guilty about keeping her away from a career or else about cheating on her. These being the only two explanations she could think of as to why he was now going overboard in his enthusiasm. Still smiling, David concluded, This is what I call chutzpah. We are all proud of her. She is a prize, always was, said Aunt Esther in a voice so sentimental that it sounded as if Ella had left the table and was gone for good. They all gazed at her lovingly. Even Evie didn't make a cynical remark and only for once seemed to care about something other than her books. Ella forced herself to appreciate this moment of kindness, but she felt an overwhelming exhaustion that she had never experienced before. She secretly prayed for someone to change the subject. Janet, her old daughter, must have heard the prayer, for she suddenly chimed in. I have some good news too. All heads turned towards her, faces beaming with expectation. Scott and I have decided to get married, Janet announced. Oh. I know what you guys are going to say, uh, that we haven't finished college yet and uh, all that, but you've got to understand, we both feel ready for the next big move. An awkward silence descended upon the kitchen table as a warmth that had canopied them just a moment ago evaporated. Oli and Evie exchanged blank looks and Aunt Esther froze with her hand tightened around a glass of apple juice. David put his fork aside as if he had no appetite left and squinted at Janet with his tight brown eyes that were deeply creased with smile lines at the corners. However, right now he was anything but smiling. His mouth had drawn into a pout as though He had just downed a swig of vinegar. Great! I expected you to share my happiness, but I get this cold treatment inside? Janet whined. You just said you were getting married? Remarked David, as if Janet didn't know what she had said and needed to be informed. Dad, I know it seems a bit too soon, but Scott proposed to me the other day and I have already said yes. But why? asked Ella. From the way Janet looked at her, Ella reconned that was not the kind of question her daughter had expected. She would rather have been asked when or how. In either case, it meant that she could start shopping for her wedding dress. The question why was another matter altogether and had completely caught her off guard. Because I love him, I guess? Janet's tone was slightly condensing. Honey, what I meant was, what the rush? insisted Ella. Are you pregnant or something? Aunt Esther twitched in her chair. Her face turned, her anguish visible. She took an antacid tablet from her pocket and started chewing on it. I am going to be an uncle, Evie said giggling. Ella held Janet's hand and gave it a gentle squeeze. You can always tell us the truth. You know that, right? We'll stand by you no matter what. Mom, will you please stop that? Janet snapped as she pulled her hand away. 
This has nothing to do with the pregnancy. You're embarrassing me. I was just trying to help. Ella responded calmly, calmness being a state she had been lately finding harder and harder to achieve. By insulting me, you mean. Apparently, the only way you can see Scott and me getting married is me being knocked up? Does it ever occur to you that I might, just might, want to marry this guy because I love him? We have been dating for eight months now. This elected scoff from Allah. Oh, yeah, as if you could tell a man's character in eight months. Your father and I have been married for almost 20 years. And even we can't claim to know everything about each other. Eight months is nothing in our relationship. <laughs> it took God only six days to create the entire universe, said Evie beaming. But cold stares from everyone at the table forced him back into silence. Sensing the escalating tension, David, his eyes fixed on his elder daughter, his bro furrowed in thought, interjected. Honey, what your mom is trying to say is that dating is one thing, marrying is quite another. But dad, did you think we would date forever? Janet asked, drawing in a deep breath, Ella said. To be perfectly blunt, we were expecting you to grow out of it. You're too young to get involved in any serious relationship. You know what I'm thinking, mom, Janet said in a voice so flat as to be unrecognizable. I'm thinking you're projecting your own fears onto me. But just because you're married so young and had a baby when you were at my age, that doesn't mean I'm going to make the same mistake. Ella blushed crimson as if slapped in the face. From deep within, she remembered the difficult pregnancy that had resulted in Janet's premature birth. As a baby and then as a toddler, her daughter had drained all of her energy, which was why she had waited six years before getting pregnant again. Sweetheart, we were happy for you when you started dating Scott, David said cautiously, trying a different strategy. He's a nice guy, but who knows what he'll be thinking after graduation? Things might be very different then. Janet gave a small nod that conveyed little more than fiend acquiescence. Then she said, Is this because Scott isn't Jewish? David trolled his eyes in disbelief. He had always taken pride in being an open-minded and cultured father, avoiding negative remarks about her race, religion or gender in the house. Janet, however, seemed relentless. Turning to her mother, she asked, Can you look into my eye and tell me you would still be making same objection if Scott were a young Jewish man named Aaron? Janet's voice needled with bitterness and sarcasm, and Ella feared there was more of that welling up inside her daughter. Sweetheart, I'll be completely honest with you even if you might not like it. I know how wonderful it is to be young and in love. Believe me, I do. But to get married to someone from a different background is a big gamble. And as your parents, we want to make sure you are doing the right thing. And how do you know the right thing is the right thing for me? The question threw Ella off a little. She sighed and massaged her forehead as if on the verge of a migraine. I love him, mom. Does that mean anything to you? Do you remember that word from somewhere? He makes my heart beat faster. I can't live without him. Ella heard herself chuckle. It was not her intention to make fun of her daughter's feelings. Not at all but was probably what her laughing to herself sounded like. For reasons unknown to her, she felt extremely nervous. She had fights with Janet before, hundreds of them, 
but today it felt as though she were quarreling with something else something bigger mom haven't you ever been in love janet retorted a hint of contempt creeping into her tone oh give me a break stop daydreaming and get real will you you're being so Alice eyes darted toward the windows hunting for a dramatic word until finally she came up with romantic what's wrong with being romantic janet asked sounding offended really what was wrong with being romantic ella wondered since when she was so annoyed by romanticism unable to answer the question tugging at the edges of her mind she continued all the same come on honey which century you are living in just get into your head women don't marry the men they fall in love with when push comes to shove they choose the guy who will be a good father and a reliable husband love is only a sweet feeling bound to come and quickly go away when she finished talking ella turned to her husband David has clasped his hand in front of him slowly as if through water and was looking at her like he had never seen her before I know why you're doing this Janet said you are jealous of my happiness and my youth you want to make an unhappy housewife out of me you want me to be you mom Ella felt a strange sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach as if she had a giant stroke sitting there was she an unhappy housewife a washed up mom trapped in a failing marriage was this how her children saw her and her husband too what about friends and neighbors suddenly she had the feeling that everyone around her secretly pitied her and the suspicion was so painful that she gasped you should apologize to your mom david said turning to janet with a frown on his face it's all right i don't expect any apology janet gave her mother a more clear and just like that she pushed back her chair threw her napkin aside and walked out of kitchen After a minute Orly and Evy silently followed suit either in an unusual act of solitary tree with their elder sister or because they had gotten bored of all this adult talk Aunt Esther left next mumbling some poor excuse while chewing fiercely on her last antacid tablet David and Ella remained at the table an intense awkward hanging in the air between them it pained ella to have to face this void which as they both knew had nothing to do with janet or any of their children david grabbed the fork he had put aside and inspected it for a while so should i conclude that you didn't marry the man you loved oh please that's not what i meant What is it you meant then? David said, still talking to the fork. I thought you were in love with me when we got married. I was in love with you, Ella said, but couldn't help adding, back then. So, when did you stop loving me? David asked, that pan. Ella looked at her husband in astonishment, like somebody who had never seen her reflection before. and who now held a mirror to her face she had stopped loving him it was a question she had never asked herself before she wanted to respond but lacked not so much the will as the words deep inside she knew it was the two of them they should be concerned about not their children but instead they were doing what they both were best at letting the days go by the routine take over and the time run its course of inevitable topper she started to cry unable to hold this continuing sadness that had without her knowledge become a part of who she was 
Stavert turned his anguished face away. They both knew he hated to see her cry just as much as she hated to cry in front of him. Fortunately, the phone rang just then, saving them. Stavert picked it up. Hello? Yes, she's here. Hold on, please. Ella pulled herself together and spoke up, doing her best to sound in good spirits. Uh, yes, uh, this is Ella. Hi, this is Michelle. Sorry to bother you over the weekend. Chirped a young woman's voice. It's just that yesterday Steve wanted me to check in with you and I simply forgot. Uh, did you have a chance to start working on the manuscript? Oh, Ella sighed only now remembering the task awaiting her. Her first assignment at literary agency was to read a novel by an unknown European author. She was then expected to write an extensive report on it. Tell him not to worry, I have already started reading. Ella lied, ambitious and headstrong. Michelle was the kind of person she didn't want to upset on her first assignment. Oh, good. How's it? Ella paused, puzzled as what to say. She didn't know anything about the manuscript, except that it was a historical novel centered on the life of the famous mystic poet Rumi, who she learned was called the Shakespeare of the Islamic world. Oh, it's a very mystical? Ella chuckled, hoping to cover with a joke. But Michelle was all business. Right, she said flatly. Listen, I think you need to get on this. And it might take longer than you expect to write a report on a novel like that. There was a distance muttering on the phone as Michelle's voice trailed off. Ella imagined her juggling several tasks simultaneously, checking emails, reading a review on her on one of her authors, taking a bite from her tuna salad sandwich and polishing her fingernails, all while talking on the phone. Are you still there? Michelle asked a minute later. Yes, I am. Good. Listen, it's crazy in here. I need to go. Just keep in mind the deadline is in three weeks. I know, Ella said abruptly, trying to sound more determined. I'll make the deadline. The truth was, Ella wasn't sure she wanted to evaluate this manuscript at all. In the beginning, she had been so eager and confident. It had felt thrilling to be the first one to read an unpublished novel by an unknown author and to play, however, small role in his fate. But now she wasn't sure if she could concentrate on a subject as irrelevant to her life as Sufism and a time as distant as 13th century. Michelle must have detected her hesitation. Is there a problem? She asked. When no answer came, she grew instant. Listen, uh, you can confide in me. After a bit of silence, Ella decided to tell her the truth. It's just that I'm not sure I am in the right state of mind these days to concentrate on a historical novel. I mean, I'm interested in Rumi and all that, but uh, still the subject is alien to me. Uh, perhaps you could give me another novel, you know, something I could more easily relate to. That's just a skewed approach, said Michelle. You think you can work better with the books you know something about? Not at all. Just because you live in this state, you can't expect to edit only novels that take place in Massachusetts, right? This is not what I meant, Ella said and immediately realized she had uttered the same sentence too many times in this afternoon. She glanced at her husband to see if he too had noticed this, but David's expression was hard to decipher. Most of the time, we have to read books that have nothing to do with our lives. That's part of our job. Just this week, I finished working on a book by an Iranian woman who used to operate a brothel in Tehran and had to flee the country. Should I have told her to send the manuscript to an Iranian agency instead? No, uh, of course not. 
Alam mumbled, feeling silly and small. Isn't connecting people to distant lands and cultures one of the strengths of good literature? Sure it is. Listen, forgot what I said. You'll have a report on your desk before the deadline. Ella conceded, hating Michelle for treating her as if she were the dullest person alive and hating herself for allowing this to happen. Wonderful. That's the spirit, Michelle concluded in her sing-song voice. Don't get me wrong, but I think you should bear in mind that there are dozens of people out there who would love to have your job, and most of them are almost half your age. That'll keep you motivated. When Ella hung up the phone, she found David watching her, his face solemn and reserved. He seemed to be waiting for them to pick up where they had left off. But she didn't feel like mulling over their daughter's future anymore, if that was what they had been worrying about in the first place. Later in the day, she was alone on the porch sitting in her favorite rocking chair, looking at the orangey red Northampton sunset. The sky felt so close and open that you could almost touch it. Her brain had gone quiet as if tired of all noise swirling inside. This month's credit card payments, all these bad eating habits, ever's poor grades, Aunt Esther and her sad cakes, her dog's birds decaying health, Janet's marriage plans, her husband's secret flings, the absence of love in her life. One by one, she locked them in a small mental boxes. In that frame of mind, Ella took the manuscript out of its package and bounced it in her hand as if weighing it. The title of the novel was written on the coverage in indigo ink, Sweet Blasphemy. Ella had been told that nobody knew much about the author, a certain A.Z. Zahra who lived in Holland his manuscript had been shipped to the literacy agency from Amsterdam with a postcard inside the envelope. On the front of the postcard was a picture of tulip fields in dazzling pinks, yellows and purples. And on the back, a note written in delicate handwriting. Dear Sir or Madam, Greetings from Amsterdam. The story I herewith send you takes place in 13th century Konya in Asia Minor. But sincerely, I believe that it cuts across countries, cultures, and centuries. I hope you will have the time to read Sweet Blasphemy, a historical, mystical novel on the remarkable bond between Jumi, the best poet and most revered spiritual leader in the history of Islam and Shams of Tabriz, an unknown, unconventional dervish full of scandals and surprises. May love be always with you, and you always sounded with love. A.Z. Sahra Ella sensed that the postcard has piqued the literary agency's curiosity, but Steve was not a man who had time to read the work of an amateur writer. So he had handed the package to his assistant, Michelle who had passed it on to her new assistant. This is how sweet blasphemy ended up in Ella's hand. Little did she know that this was going to be not just any book, but the book that changed her life. In the time she was reading it, her life would be rewritten. Ella turned up the first page. There was a note about the writer. E.Z. Zahra lives in Amsterdam with his books, cats, and turtles when he is not traveling around the world. Sweet Blasphemy is his first novel and most probably his last. He has no intention of becoming a novelist and has written this book purely out of admiration and love for the great philosopher, mystic, and poet Rumi and his beloved son Shams of the Brace. Her eyes moved down the page to the next line, and there Ella read something that rang strangely familiar. For despite what some people say, love is not only a sweet feeling bound to come 
and quickly go away. Her jaw dropped as she realized this was the contradiction of the exact sentence she had spoken to her daughter in the kitchen earlier in the day. She stood still for a moment, shivering with the thought that some mysterious force in the universe or else this writer, whoever he might be, was spying on her. Perhaps he had written this book knowing beforehand what kind of person was going to read it first. This writer had her in mind as his reader. For some reason, unbeknownst to her, Anna found the idea both disturbing and exciting. In many ways, the 21st century is not that different from the 13th century. Both will be recorded in history as times of unprecedented religious clashes, cultural misunderstandings, and a general sense of insecurity and fear of the other. At times like these, the need for love is greater than ever. A sudden wind blew in her direction, cool and strong, scattering the leaves on the porch. The beauty of the sunset drifted toward the western horizon, and the air felt dull, joyless. Because love is very essence and purpose of life. As Rumi remind us, it hits everybody, including those who shun love. Even those who use the word romantic as a sign of disapproval. Ella was bowled over as if she had read there. Love hits everybody, even a middle aged housewife in Northampton named Ella Robinston. Her gut instinct told her to put the manuscript aside, go into the house, give Michelle a call and told her there was no way she could write a report on this novel. Instead, she took a deep breath, turned the page, and started to read.